The next item of business is a debate on motion number 13112 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Apprenticeship Week. Could members who wish to speak please press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, maximum 13 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I have seen the look in your eye um, and will try to bring it in uh, a little uh, more short than that. Um, Today is an opportunity to promote the forthcoming Scottish Apprenticeship Week, uh, to celebrate the success of Scotland's modern apprentices and everyone associated with the programme, which has become a key element of our approach to economic development and to youth employment. The prominence of apprenticeships across manifestos for the recent general election illustrates cross-party understanding of their importance. They are unique in terms of supporting young people into sustainable and rewarding careers while contributing to the skills needs of our businesses. Modern apprenticeships don't only support young people, uh, they're open to people of all ages. And, and given the diverse needs of the businesses that use them, it is right that this is the case. Today, however, uh, I'd uh, like to focus on the important role uh, that they play in supporting our ambitions for youth employment. The overall success of Scotland's modern apprenticeship programme is undeniable, and its contribution to our economy continues to evolve. This government has grown the programme from 15,000 starts in 2007 uh, to over 25,000 new places each year for the last three years. These opportunities span the Scottish economy from sectors with a long tradition of training apprentices, like construction and engineering, to growth in newer sectors for apprenticeships, such as financial services. We're now committed to increasing the target to at least 30,000 new modern apprenticeship opportunities each year by 2020. This is a central part of our ambition to develop a world-class vocational education system that matches our world-class and free system of higher education. We need to ensure that work-based learning, like all parts of our education system, is valued by employers and offers opportunities to all young people, irrespective of their background. We need to ensure that more employers, particularly small employers, engage with the programme. And we need to align modern apprenticeship opportunities with emerging growth sectors across our economy. I wanted to just some, uh, say just something about the week uh, that's upcoming. I congratulate Skills Development Scotland on the work that it does to deliver uh, Scotland's modern apprenticeship programme. I also congratulate the network of delivery partners, uh, including private training providers, local authorities, third sector providers and colleges who work every day with thousands of apprentices and employers across the country. Scottish Apprenticeship Week, which SDS is coordinating across Scotland, will highlight the reach and impact of the programme. I myself will be taking part in a range of events, including a business conference with SCDI and a visit to GTG tra training to meet some of their apprentices in training. And the Minister for Youth and Women's Employment is also undertaking a number of visits. I understand SDS has invited members to local Apprenticeship Week events around the country, and I would strongly encourage everyone to see for themselves the benefits that the programme uh, delivers. Now, over recent years, Scotland has made significant progress in addressing youth unemployment. It is important to acknowledge the crucial role played by employers, training providers, colleges and third sector organisations in supporting our young people uh, toward and into work through an extremely challenging period of the recession. A return to the levels of youth unemployment to pre-recessionary levels is an important milestone, but we must maintain our commitment to going further than that. In partnership with local authorities, we've embarked on the implementation of an ambitious strategy to reduce youth unemployment by 40% by 2021. This will take Scotland to a level that will match the top performing European countries and expanding our modern apprenticeship programme will provide a key contribution to this. Equally, this strategy is as much about promoting to school, school pupils and those who influence them that there are many routes into a wide variety of good jobs. The world is changing rapidly and jobs are evolving. We need to develop our collaboration and crucial links between schools, colleges and business across children's broad general education and senior phase in exciting new ways in order to make this vision a reality. One way in which we are doing this 
is through the introduction of foundation apprenticeships, which offer young people the chance of work-based learning as part of an existing modern apprenticeship framework, but while still in the senior phase uh, of school. Now, any expansion in modern apprenticeships must be driven by employer demand. Our apprenticeship scheme is tied to real jobs uh, in the labour market. We already prioritise the funding contributions for modern apprenticeships towards key and enabling sectors of the economy and will continue to do this. Skills investment plans and regional skills assessments are important elements of Scotland's skills planning system. Developed in partnership with industry, they provide a detailed insight into the current and future skills needs of Scotland's economy, allowing our education and skills system to align with employer needs. And we want to persuade more employers to participate in the programme, so it's important that the quality of training being delivered remains at a high standard. This year, we're introducing a Pathfinder project to independently quality assure the training delivered through the Modern Apprenticeship programme. Now, in its report, the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, the Wood Commission, highlighted key equality challenges across vocational education. And I know there are a number of members in the chamber who have very particular concerns uh, in this area. Uh, not just across vocational education, of course, those equality challenges uh, are felt across the whole of the labour market and indeed society. So we've got, all got to take these challenges seriously. Through our youth employment strategy, we committed to bring forward new initiatives to encourage more people from underrepresented groups to take part in the modern apprenticeship programme. As cultural norms do not change quickly, some of this activity will need to address wider societal issues in the long term. However, we've also got to look to make improvement where we can now. To implement this commitment, we provided SDS with additional funding in 2014-15 to develop a range of equality activity. And I'd like to highlight examples of some of the work that this supported. First, in regard to occupational segregation, it's important that we recognise that progress has been made on occupational segregation within the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. In 2013-14, 41% of Modern Apprenticeship starts were women, compared to only 27% in 2008-9. This is good progress, but there are still significant gender imbalances that need to be addressed. We need to widen young people's perceptions from an early stage to ensure that they make more informed choices. SDS is already working with leading gender equality organisations and local authorities to challenge and tackle gender segregation. Through the recent SDS campaign, You Work, You Learn, You Earn, we promote modern apprenticeships as, career, as a career option for young women, uh, encouraging them to consider uh, modern apprenticeship roles in sectors traditionally regarded as male dominated and I, I think I could uh, say uh, for the Minister as for myself that we've met a number of these young women in uh, areas of the uh, labour market that wouldn't normally be associated uh, with uh, women's employment but they are beginning to move into those areas and it's very good that those role models uh, now exist. SDS is also working with a number of wider partners including Engender, Close the Gap, Equate, the Institute of Physics and CITB to identify and address some of the most difficult and ingrained issues that are preventing young women from considering non-traditional areas of employment. Now, during 2013-14, only 0.4% of all modern apprenticeship starts declared themselves as having a disability. And I know this is a matter of concern uh, for a very great number of people. This figure is based on self-declaration with evidence of some under-reporting. But nevertheless, it's clear that disabled people are underrepresented within modern apprenticeships as they are in the workforce as a whole. And we need to work on a number of fronts to change the perceptions of employers, parents, and indeed young disabled people themselves. Some of the steps that SDS is currently taking to achieve this include working with Bernardo's and Remploy on specific targeted pathway projects to help over 100 disabled young people through the Employability Fund to enter into a modern apprenticeship. This will align with the help available through Community Jobs Scotland, 
where we're already providing support and job training opportunities to unemployed young people aged 16 to 24, including those who face additional barriers to employment. But increasing the participation of disabled people in work goes beyond the modern apprenticeship programme, obviously. The DWP's Access to Work programme plays an important role in helping disabled people in Scotland to remain in work. And I would be concerned if reported proposals to limit the support available through Access to Work adversely impacted on disabled people in Scotland. Yes, of course. Liam McArthur. Very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. I listened to, to what she had to say in terms of um, societal norms that need to be overcome, and I think she's, she's absolutely correct in that respect. But she'll be aware of the fairly significant discrepancy between the figures of disabled people involved in modern apprenticeships south of the border and those north of the border. I think the same issues of uh, under-declaration probably still exist. Is there any um, work that's been done by the government to try and get a better understanding about why this discrepancy is there? We are looking at that very carefully because there is a significant difference and we need to understand how that has come about. It, it won't have happened overnight uh, and there are some real issues there. One of the things maybe, of course, that what we're looking at in Scotland has always traditionally been a jobs-led apprenticeship programme. Uh, um, and therefore there's been historically perhaps a bigger challenge with some employers. Uh, but I wouldn't want to kind of make that as, as a kind of gross assumption that that's the only thing that's been happening. I think there may be more going on. Um, uh, we're building a ca capacity actually across the skills and training landscape uh, and SDS is taking concrete steps through a programme of continuing professional development to ensure that SDS staff and training providers uh, are better able to support disabled people into modern apprenticeships. So we want to take a, a range of actions and SDS has also set up an equalities advice line uh, and is also developing an additional support needs resource guide for training providers uh, uh, in this area. Uh, they're also working with employer bodies to highlight the benefits to employers of recruiting from a more diverse population, including young disabled people, and helping them to access support for disabled employees. Now, I want to say just something about uh, the, uh, the group of young people that would be broadly classified as BME there, less likely to participate in certain vocational pathways for a number, again, of complex reasons, including in some cases the cultural attitude uh, of their parents and changing the perceptions of the value of modern apprenticeships will play a key role in increasing the number of BME young people uh, considering this as the right option uh, for them. So SDS is currently working with a, a number of organisations uh, to engage directly with BME communities to change uh, these perceptions and raise awareness. Um, the uh, uh, SDS is also undertaking research to better understand the barriers, real and perceived, and building an evidence base on which to base uh, an improvement uh, plan. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm conscious of the time. I do want to make sure I do get this in, though, because what we want to do is commit to taking real tangible action. It follows on what Liam MacArthur said, to improve the accessibility of modern apprenticeship opportunities to all young people within our society. So today I can announce an allocation of £500,000 to the SDS, specifically to support the final development and early delivery of an equalities action plan, which will look uh, across these uh, various areas. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I'm proud of how far we've come since 2007. I'm proud of the work that we are doing and the targets we're setting ourselves uh, for uh, 2020 in terms of apprenticeships and 2021 in terms of youth unemployment. And I do hope that everybody in the chamber today will join with me in celebrating the success of the programme, uh, one of the many Scottish Apprenticeship Week events taking place next week. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Siobhan McMahon to speak to and move Amendment 13112.3, maximum of nine minutes, please. I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Government for bringing forward this debate to celebrate Scottish Apprenticeship Week and I welcome the money that the, the um, Cabinet Secretary has just announced, although probably with my remarks you'll understand why I'm maybe not welcome that it's SDS that will um, be the function for that, but um, I do welcome the money and any help that will address the issues um, that the Labour have brought to the Chamber today. It's a great opportunity for me to offer our support as a Labour Party to working with the Scottish Government to help as many young people as possible in Scotland access apprenticeships. The belief in the potential of our young people and their capacity to excel if we empower them to do so is undoubtedly a belief shared across this Chamber and Scotland. The Parliament works best when we come together across the Chamber and work towards improving the opportunities of our constituents. 
I and my colleagues welcome the commitment made by the Government in December 2014 to take forward the recommendations of Sir Ian Wood's Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. I hope the Government is successful in the aim of cutting youth unemployment by 40 per cent. Apprenticeships, as highlighted by Apprenticeship Week, are obviously a key part of this. Throughout our public sector, decision makers and staff on the front lines make a tremendous effort to ensure opportunities are open for as many young people as possible. I know that several colleagues have worked in and around local government, and they won't need me to remind them of some of the leading edge schemes our councils have come up with. Both Falkirk and South Lancashire councils' effort to facilitate apprenticeships in their communities are well worthy of recognition and merit. But given time constraints, I will mention only one, my native North Lanarkshire. Schools in North Lanarkshire offer their pupils real practical opportunities. During the 2013-14 session, the in-school vocational education delivery model enabled over 2,000 senior students to undertake vocational training courses alongside traditional subjects in 63 custom-made facilities across 24 mainstream and eight specialist schools. The subjects are varied from construction, craft to beauty care and are SQA certified. Two North Lanarkshire schools have pioneered a programme where young people are offered the opportunity to learn the trade of professional cookery, whilst working with North Lanarkshire for a period of one year, gaining practical work experience while they undertake a vocational qualification. Our councils are at the front line against youth unemployment, and I have always held the view that it is those who deal with such issues every day who are best equipped to know how to tackle the same issues at a national level. I think it is important that our government continues to empower them to improve their offer to young people at a local level. I know that the Government say it is a key aim of the Administration to enshrine equalities into every aspect of its legislation. Perhaps it is the years I spent on the Parliament's Equal Opportunities Committee, but I feel it would be remiss of me not to mention the real concerns I have about their success in doing so with the apprenticeship programme. I acknowledge the efforts of the Government to offer the opportunity of an apprenticeship to all, regardless of background. It is to be welcomed that the number of young women entering apprenticeships increased significantly by 2012-13 to the point where there were almost four times as many female apprenticeships as there had been in 2008-09. Yet the Audit Scotland report for March 2015 indicated that the Government's flagship modern apprenticeship programme had only served to reinforce gender segregation. As I am sure many in the Chamber already know, in 2012-13, 98% of construction apprentices were male and 97% of childcare apprentices were female. The Quality and Human Rights Commission has stated that the uptake of modern apprenticeships in Scotland is typified by significant gender segregation, with ethnic minorities and disabled people also appearing to have low levels of access to all forms of apprenticeships. It is a depressing fact that less than 0.5% of all modern apprenticeship placements are taken by someone with a declared disability. Skills Development Scotland have been tasked with addressing the gender imbalance which exists in sectors like construction and health and social care. Yet this seems to have had little impact. SDS' own figures indicate that as of December 2014, only 4% of engineering apprentices in Scotland were women. To ask SDS to take the lead while tackling a societal issue such as occupational segregation and expect them to make great strides seems to me to be a rather optimistic course of action. Yes, it should be incumbent on them to encourage young women to seek out alternative careers, but really this seems to be out with that organisation's abilities and remit. During my time on the Equal Opportunities Committee, gender segregation in Scotland was an issue which was spoken about time and time again. Whilst compiling the Women in Work report, we heard evidence that indicated that there was not a high female uptake among young women at school for science, technology, engineering and math subjects. SDS themselves indicated that only 15 per cent of those doing IT courses, for instance, were female. If we are serious about breaking through glass ceilings, this is a problem which has to be tackled at a much earlier stage. We need to hear the experiences of successful women in these fields and listen to how they think we can foster a new generation of young female apprentices in these areas. Now, I don't wish to have a prolonged discussion. Yes? As, uh, I think the person that trained the first female joiner in Argyll well over 20 years ago, and as I'm sure William MacArthur will confirm, Orkney Island Council now employ a young apprentice female stonemason. Do you feel that there's a, an opportunity for employers to realise the significant benefits of 
introducing women into their workforce? Siobhan McMahon. Yes, I totally agree, agree, but the depressing thing is we're talking about one in your example there after 20 years, and I know it's a, supposed to be something positive, but I think we have to do a lot more um, than we are doing just now. As I said, I don't want to have a prolonged discussion on this during a debate on apprenticeships, but I cannot fail to mention the government's cuts to colleges and the disproportionate effect that they've had on women. There has been a drop of 41 per cent, that's 41 per cent, in the number of women at college in Scotland since 2007-8. How can we expect women to reach their potential if we are pulling the ladder out from underneath them in this way? After the publication of the Government's response to the Wood Commission, I wrote to the Minister and asked her about the Government's plans to tackle occupational segregation in the workforce more broadly. I was heartened by her response where she outlined some of the pilots the Government was sponsoring, and I hope similar schemes will prove effective in challenging gender segregation in the workplace. In the past, I have received correspondence from SDS regarding concerns I have put forward in Parliament that the modern apprenticeship programme does not deliver for not only women, but the protected groups under the Equality Act in general. I do not doubt the sincerity of the commitment of those at SDS to protecting our vulnerable groups, but I think the organisation could do more. In October 2013, I asked the then Minister, Angela Constance, how many people participating in the programme identified as being part of the LGBT community. The letter I received from Mr Danny Logue, then SDS Director of Operations, made clear that their organisation did not gather this information. For a public body tasked with ensuring a programme is representative, to neglect gathering the most basic information is unacceptable. Similarly, in December 2013, I asked the Government how many people in the Modern Apprenticeship Programme had a learning difficulty. The response I received from SDS indicated that whilst they asked about disability, they did not differentiate between physical and mental challenges. With the only question asked of applicants, do you have a mental or a physical impairment which has had a long-term and adverse effect on your ability to perform normal day-to-day -day activities? There is no opportunity for candidates to elaborate. A yes or no is all that is required. Given that the challenges facing those who identify as having a physical disability and those who have a complex mental health issues are so different by any standard, they should not be lumped together. No useful information can be gained from such a narrow and standardised test. I also think we have to look at a protection for apprentices currently serving their time, whose employers are faced with redundancies. I know that this is an issue that has been spoken about before, but I believe a lot more should and could be done in this area. Recently, I had the pleasure of attending the Young Scotland's Got Talent Lanarkshire event within my region. The event was a great example of third sector and private sector groups coming together with local authorities to help young people with complex conditions achieve their potential. The event appealed to the aspirations of those attending and encouraged employers to offer motivated young people with conditions such as autism an opportunity, be it through a job or an apprenticeship. Among the attendees was an agreement that if the support networks were in place and opportunities available, young Scots of various backgrounds could reach their potential. There was a sense that if we work together, we can achieve so much more. Across the those, Chamber, please. I believe that there is much in the way of common ground and common purpose on this issue. On these benches, we are happy to support the Government's motion. However, more work needs to be done in raising the number of apprenticeships being taken up by women and LGBT and black, Asian and minority ethnic people. That is why, if we are serious, we must support Labour's amendment. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move amendment 13112.2. Ms Scanlon, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And if I continue on the uh, common purpose and uh, common agreement, we also welcome this debate going into Scottish Apprenticeship Week uh, to highlight the work done, the opportunities gained, the life chances enhanced, and to look at how much more we can do. Uh, this would include ensuring that modern apprenticeships are open to all who could benefit from them, and I will also be doing my visit next week. I, I move the amendment in my name, and I can say that we support the government motion and the Labour amendment, and I trust that our amendment will be taken in uh, as positively and constructively as it's written to improve accessibility to modern apprenticeships to all in future. Uh, I'd like to go to the numbers uh, for male and female apprenticeships and not just look at the occupational segregation, because at level two, male and female apprentices are almost equal. At level three, there's about 50% more males than females. Level four, three times more male than female. At level five, ten times more male than female. I do think that this needs to be looked at. It's not just the culture, not just the occupational segregation, but it's also uh, the level of achievement. I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said about the dis uh, disabled 
and uh, I very much welcome the 500,000 to address the equality of opportunity. Um, I, I do think that uh, the fact that in England almost 8% of apprenticeships are undertaken by people with a declared disability and in Scotland it's less than 1%, in fact it's 0.7. So I do welcome the fact that they will be looking at this issue and I also welcome the commitment to looking at the support that can be given where appropriate uh, to ensure that modern apprenticeships are open to disabled people. There can be no doubt that the abolition of employers' national insurance contributions for apprentices aged under 25 is a significant positive step to incentivising employers to recruit more uh, apprentices, and I expect MSPs all across the Chamber will welcome this initiative. At last week's cross-party group on colleges, we heard of uh, considerable good practice including the articulation from apprentice training and HNC to second year university, which can be achieved by colleges and universities working more closely to ensure that second year students uh, coming from FE and from apprenticeships are at the same starting point in terms of knowledge, experience and qualifications so that training uh, for an apprenticeship doesn't always end with an, uh, an apprenticeship and it can continue. Edinburgh College's briefing paper highlights their aim to introduce apprenticeships in growing industries such as IT, energy, life sciences, finance and management. And I do welcome this, particularly given the recent Audit Scotland report last year stating that there was very little correlation between modern apprenticeships and the growth industries in Scotland. So I do welcome this from Edinburgh College, and I think the SDS could, could do more. Lockheed Martin, in their briefing, state that there's currently a shortage of young people entering digital technology, uh, and that came with the warning from Lockheed Martin that Scotland could lose out on the huge economic benefits to our nation without a stream of well-qualified young people coming into the industry. And I think we'll have to listen to employers. I have to say, I especially liked ASDIS briefing, ASDIS briefing stating that they hire for attitude and train for skill. Uh, and I think it's worth putting on the record that I feel we should do more to value apprenticeships and indeed jobs in the retail and hospitality sectors, uh, given the huge numbers uh, that they employ. The fact that the Chief Executive of ASDA, Andy Clark, began his retail career aged 17 as a supermarket trolley attendant is proof that this is not just training for a few months, but does provide a proper career path. Uh, there is much good work being done, uh, but there are also, uh, including foundation apprenticeships, uh, but there are also some concerns. One of my concerns is 93,000 young people aged between 16 and 24 in Scotland who are not in education, employment or training. I think we need to know what is being done to target this group, which increased by 3,000 in 2013. The other difference is, and I welcome the government... I'm running out of time. In the final minute, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the other thing is that the government, and I welcome announcing the modern apprentice starts, but I think we need to look at the modern apprentice achievements. Uh, if we simply look at 2014 15, 19,500 starts in modern apprenticeships, but 13,500 achieved a modern apprenticeship. So, in other words, out of 19,500 MA starts, 6,000 didn't achieve an apprenticeship. And this was down by 6% on the previous year. The point is that the measurement should not just be on those who enrol in the programme. The success has to be judged on those who successfully complete the programme and a 28% rate of non-achievement is not acceptable. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And we now move to open debate. Six minute speeches. A call on Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Ian Gray. Very tight for time today. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. 
The focus for too long across not just Scotland but also the UK has been the view of some parents and educationalists that the only path to a successful career or good job prospect was the academic route uh, via university. Many job opportunities for trained craftsmen and women pay higher salaries than university graduates would expect. For instance, according to one recruitment website, bricklayers can expect to earn 50% more than the average national wage. Choosing a vocational career and particularly designed to be an apprentice can, for many young people, bring instant benefits in that they earn a salary while working, they also gain a recognised qualification while working, there is on-the-job on the training that uh, provides real work experience, there is funding to help meet training costs, and for many it is a shorter route to a well-paid job than, than university. The City of Edinburgh Council and the CITB organised construction career tester sessions to give potential candidates interest in construction careers the opportunity to come along and experience a real project, talk with apprentices, project managers and experience a construction site. The reason that this is important is that as the economy is improving, there is more and more demand for skilled individuals across the construction industry. Some of this will be met by people returning after the recession, but for work workforce planning reasons, the sector needs apprentices. But it's not just in construction where there are apprenticeship opportunities. The Skills Development Scotland website highlights that just some of the opportunities currently available in the Edinburgh area, ranging from Heriot Watt University in my constituency, where there are modern apprenticeship vacancies for mechanical technicians to install, maintain and operate research equipment, including instruments, electrical equipment and robotics, to landscape, landscape gardening and horticultural modern apprenticeships with a small company. The briefing from Edinburgh College highlighted that they currently employ 148 modern apprenticeships across a key sectors including engineering, hospitality, automotive, hairdressing, childcare, highways maintenance and security. They have indicated that next year this number will increase by up to another 50 modern apprentices. Of course, Edinburgh College works with employers and training providers to deliver apprenticeship training in additional areas including construction trades, care, business administration, accounting and sports and leisure, with more than a thousand apprentices training there each year. Over the last three years, the Scottish Government has delivered over 77,000 modern apprenticeship opportunities, exceeding the target set of 25,000 each year. The Government has announced that the number will increase to 30,000 new modern apprenticeships by 2020. This is nearly double the number of modern apprenticeships that were in existence in 2007-8. In addition, the new opportunities will be focused on higher level apprenticeships that will equip even more of our young people with the skills they need for the jobs of the future. In order to attract young people to apprenticeships, we need to provide that incentive that's so that any decision they make about employment is not coloured by short-term judgement, i.e. how much am I going to get paid? It surely cannot be right that somebody can hold down a job and be only paid £2.72 per hour. And despite the increase announced by the UK government recently about increasing the minimum wage for apprentices, current apprentices are paid 72% of the young person's rate and 42% of the adult minimum wage of £6.50. We already know that the adult minimum wage is inadequate, hence the calls for paying the living wage. Therefore, how can it be acceptable to only pay £2.73 per hour to an apprentice? The Cabinet Secretary has already called for the UK Government to bring payment for apprentices into line with the other bans at the national minimum wage. The apprentice rate was introduced on 1 October 2010 by the Conservative Government, reducing the pay for those apprentices who previously would have been paid the higher young persons rate. The Scottish Government has called for the devolution of the minimum wage so that this place can set the level that helps our economy grow. Of course, many companies pay higher wages to apprentices in order to retain them when they complete their training. Uh, and it is in the organisation's interest, having invested time and resources and tra to train the apprentice to meet their specific needs. 
From my own experience, I am aware that many companies who have, for many decades, uh, trained apprentices have generous pay, pay scales in place. First-year apprentices are paid a third of the, the tradesman's rate, second-year apprentices are paid a half, third-year apprentices two-thirds, and fourth-year apprentices are paid three-quarters of a qualified tradesman's rate. If we can set apprenticeship rates uh, to similar levels to best practice that already exists within many companies and organisations, you young people close, please. and their parents will see the benefits of a vocational career. Um, vocational education means that the young person is learning what related practical skills and the knowledge they need to understand how to use these skills. Many companies across the UK have signed up to the 5% Club Charter that encourages companies to employ 5% of apprentices close, and graduates please. of the workplace. In, this, in next week's National Apprenticeship Week, wouldn't it be good for all SMEs to aim for that target? Excellent. Many thanks. Now call on Ian Gray to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. My uh, family story and that of the generation of my father and myself is uh, a pretty typical one, I think. Uh, for the time. Uh, my dad uh, did an apprenticeship. He left school at 14, uh, went to SMT, did an apprenticeship as a motor mechanic. His brothers did the same things, similar apprenticeships in uh, engineering of one kind or another. And then a generation later, uh, I was the one, the first to go to university, uh, to graduate and then become a teacher, uh, a professional uh, career. And that's the story of so many families, I think, in Scotland uh, of that time. And yet, it isn't as simple as it seems, because uh, although my dad was a motor mechanic, uh, he spent his time with me uh, teaching me maths for fun. Uh, my mother gave me a love of the written word and books, and my dad gave me a love uh, of mathematics. It was that motor mechanic that sparked the interest in me, which eventually led if only fleetingly, to an ability at university to solve equations in Hilbert eigenspace. And he did that. He did that because he never stopped learning himself. Uh, when he was teaching me logarithms uh, in the living room before bed, it was because he was working through these problems in the night school classes he was attending to continue to raise his levels of skill and qualification. And as a result, he didn't end his career as a motor mechanic, but rather as a relatively senior civil servant, the manager of one of the biggest goods vehicle testing stations uh, in Scotland. He ended up in a professional career by the route of an apprenticeship. I ended up uh, in a professional career by the route uh, of uh, a university degree. We ended up pretty much in the same place, although the route was different. But that's not the only thing that was different. There were other differences. One is that I threw it all up for this, which I think he never would have done. But the other is that the truth is, although he was a motor mechanic, he could do much more than that. He could strip and rebuild a car his whole working life, but he could also rewire and replumb a house, design, draw, and make anything that you conceive, can conceive of uh, in wood. For me, I can just about change a plug. My point is that somewhere, someone somehow in society decided that I was better than him because he'd been an apprentice and I'd been to university. Somewhere, someone decided that my degree was better and worth more than his apprenticeship, which took him just as long to achieve as I did at university. That's nonsense. And it's a nonsense which has distorted the lives of too many young people in this country. It's a nonsense that does not exist in countries like Germany, and it is a nonsense that we have to change. So if Apprenticeship Week is about anything, then let's not simply make it about celebrating apprenticeships, but let's make it about beginning to rehabilitate them, to rebuild the parity of esteem they once had with academic qualifications. You know, Many things about that election last week disappointed me, but one of them was in the leaders' debate when the First Minister was asked about a budget debate where uh, we did a deal uh, with uh, the SNP in order to get a budget through. That was in 2009. And asked about what the deal was, she said she couldn't remember the detail. The detail was an increase in the apprenticeship 
programme. She never forgot her university track record, but she did forget that apprenticeship agreement. And that's disappointing. But the truth is, it's not just time to remember apprenticeships, but to get real about them as well. The Cabinet Secretary said that this SNP government inherited uh, 15,000 uh, uh, modern apprenticeships and now they have 25,000. But that's not true. Nine, over 9,000 of those 25,000 apprenticeships are level two apprenticeships, which existed but weren't called apprenticeships in 2007. The truth is in uh, 06, 07, there were 15,869 apprenticeship starts at level three or above, and in 13, 14, there were 15,655. We have not actually increased the programme at all, and it's lower than the high point back in 2004 5 when it was over 21,000. We need to get real uh, about those apprenticeships. When I met the First Minister in 2009, to negotiate that deal. He said, we mustn't let this become a numbers game where you pursue us about how many apprenticeships we've created. You have to accept my commitment to try and deliver of them, of them. And I have never done that. But the problem is the Scottish Government itself it has turned this into a numbers game. And the numbers don't actually look that good. It's true that all apprenticeships in Scotland are job-related, but it's also true in England, there are 440,000 starts, way over 10 times uh, what we have. It's true that there have been, has been little or no progress in ideas like hosted apprenticeships or agency apprenticeships or articulated Ross, apprenticeship Jones, please, routes. Please. And it's true that that route through night school that my dad followed is completely closed now because of the changes in our college sector. So if we really want to do something, for apprenticeship week, we should learn to understand apprenticeships, to love their power to change lives, to value them properly, and stop just counting them and patting ourselves on the back. Many thanks. Now call on George Adam to be followed by Mark Griffin. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And can I say that I welcome this debate during the build-up for, uh, for Apprenticeship Week next week. Over the years, I've met with many of the training organisations in my constituency and uh, many of the young people who are training towards their future career. And vocational training is very important to me because, uh, like Ian Gray, my own father, uh, had he not become an apprentice at 15 with Balfour, Kilpatrick and Paisley, then his life, and in turn my life, may have taken a completely different turn. He was a young man from Fergusley Park and he faced the many challenges that that community faces still to this very day. He failed his 11 plus exam and was put on the acad academic scrap heap until he walked into the old Baru office in Paisley and they told him to go and talk to this company. He later ran his own business in this field and employed many of his friends from his own community. The shorthand version of this very long story, presiding officer, is that this was a defining moment in his working life. This is not not unusual, as Ian Gray has already told us, uh, that there, no doubt there are many similar stories like this about how important vocational training and voc uh, apprenticeships can be. And I think we'll skip the part of the story, presiding officer, when he tried to pass these engineering skills on to his son, because that doesn't have quite as happy an ending. But as I'm aware, uh, this is how important this can make and the opportunities that it offers young people in Scotland. And that's the reason why I back the Scottish Government's vision to develop a world-class vocational education system that matches our world-class higher education system. There are many challenges, though. The interim report from the Commission for Development Scotland's Young, Force, young Workforce states, we must move on from our ingrained and, frankly, ill-informed culture that somehow vocational education is an inferior option. Presiding officer, this is an issue that keeps coming up during the evidence that we are receiving at the Education Committee at the moment with regards to our inquiry into educational attainment. There appears to be an uneven playing field with regards to academic achievement and vocational achievement. Many schools are focused purely on the academic and are not showing the leadership necessary to offer other careers for our young people. When I asked uh, some of the business representatives about the inequalities in attainment and in the workplace during one of the committee meetings, Phil Ford from the Construction Industry Training Board Scotland said, some schools measure success by the number of pupils who go to university. We need to challenge that and promote vocational careers as being equally valid. 
He was also mentioned by Terry Lanigan of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. I believe that vocational education is an important to academic young people as it is to others. The skills that are developed through work-based learning are important to everyone in society. One of the challenges is to persuade Scottish society, and particularly but not exclusively parents, to recognise the value of different routes to lifetime achievement. And that is the challenges that we're currently dealing with at this very moment, because we have many parents who actually see the academic route as the only way forward for said young child. I've heard constituents come to me who their son has wanted to go down a practical engineering career course and he's been actually because he's quite bright and academic he's been encouraged to go down that route so we need to find the balance that will make that better as well and as the, the chairman states in the forward of developing Scotland's workforce final report we also have a challenge in the fact that only 30 percent of Scottish businesses have any kind of contact with educational establishments and obviously the Scottish Government has agreed that they'll take on board many of the things said in this report but that is still an issue because we still have a, a situation where many schools and educational establishments won't let third sector organisations or won't uh, allow uh, partner organisations of said authority in to actually help and work with attainment or in this case talking about vocational uh, uh, education as well and I, I think it's one of the things that when we uh, visited the Wester Hills uh, uh, what is the Western Hills Full uh, Education Centre? Uh, uh, they actually told us that their connection with local colleges and how they worked in the whole area to make sure that they had this idea where young people could actually go down a vocational side in secondary school. And that was quite impressive for me because I think that is the way we will have to go forward. But the modern apprenticeship scheme also has problems as well, that comes across in the evidence that we're receiving, with uh, small businesses, because many small businesses believe that they, they need to see a value in the training. They need to see that that young person isn't just getting taken away from their workplace and that they're getting something back from that as well. And although that may be a perception that they have, there is something that we need to address because we need to have more small businesses involved in the modern apprenticeship programme and all forms of training as well because we have so many businesses that this could make a difference. So it needs to be relevant to these companies and these businesses as well. You know, last year when I was involved uh, in the uh, apprenticeship week, I went along to Muir Slicer uh, uh, in Paisley, and they basically are a company who have over 300 modern apprenticeships uh, across a range of sectors and boast an achievement rate of over 90%. And while I was there, I met a young woman called Chelsea McGregor, who was an example of a young woman who was actually would not have, if I had been for the modern apprenticeship scheme, may have dropped out, wouldn't have had a job either. And she told me how much it made a difference to her life and how they've been able to move things on. So I think in closing, President Officer, we have to take on board uh, what a lot of these companies are saying, but also make sure that a lot of it is perception and not reality in the situation. But we need to work with them to ensure that everyone can get this opportunity that vocational training and apprenticeships offer. And as I say, like Keane Gray, if it had not been for my father walking into that brew office, I may not be here today. Many thanks. I will now call on Mark Griffin to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on Scottish Apprenticeship Week. The Commission on Developing Scotland's Young Workforce rightly highlighted the need to do all we can to ensure apprenticeships and vocational education receives the parity with other forms of education they deserve. Not everyone is suited to an academic career in further or higher education, and even those who are, not everyone wants to pursue that academic career. It is right then that we take the opportunity this afternoon and throughout the course of next week to do all that we can to show how important and valuable an apprenticeship is. In Scotland, there seems to be a level of snobbery when it comes to the aspirations that we have for our young people. When children are growing up, parents or guardians will dream of their kids going to university one day. It, I went to university after completing my sixth year at school, along with a number of my friends. When we were in second year at uni, only halfway through, our friends who had left school after fourth year to get an apprenticeship were fully qualified and had been earning for four years. I don't know anyone personally who didn't complete their apprenticeship 
but I know plenty of people who dropped out of university in the first couple of years. I don't know anyone who completed their apprenticeship who isn't still working in that industry, but I know plenty of people who have degrees and have struggled to get a job in that area. I don't know a single person who I grew up with who went to university and now runs their own business, but I know plenty of people who completed their apprenticeships and, now, and are now successful small business owners. And when we see just how successful young people who complete apprenticeship courses can be, I think we really need to redouble our efforts to make sure that there is equality of access for women, um, those from our BME community and disabled young people. I think there are clear, clear gender equalities within vocational education and apprenticeships. And a report by the Equality and Human Rights Commission from 2013 found that although men are increasingly moving into traditionally female apprenticeship programmes, there is no evidence of an increase of women entering traditionally male apprenticeships. Now that, that's a, a worrying statement, and if that trend continues, the only possible outcome is that the gender gap between male and female apprenticeship entrants, which already sits at 59% male, 41% female, will just grow wider. And there's also a, a massive disparity in the number of disabled young people who start an apprenticeship. Around 8% of the population are disabled, and yet the percentage of modern apprentice, apprentices reporting a disability hasn't even reached a single percent in any of the past five years. And I wonder if the, the Minister is able to say in closing what Skills Development Scotland are planning to do to grow that number by way of encouraging disabled young people and also by what they plan to do with Skills Development Scotland to encourage employers to hire more disabled people. The Equality and Human Rights Commission has also commented um, that we need to harness the talents of all of Scotland's people. We're missing a trick by failing to maximise the potential of all Scotland's people. We believe that the government needs to demand greater effort from their contractors to drive up the representation of ethnic minorities and disabled people. The focus needs to shift from what a young disabled person can't do to what they can do to take advantage of their talents and skills. Um, President officer, I think it's become clear to people in my generation you know, when we see how successful our peers have been who have completed apprenticeships and that we won't be dreaming um, purely of academic futures for our children, but we'll be telling the stories of our, our friends who have um, gone on to uh, complete apprenticeships and be success, successful um, business owners. But we have to do um, the work right now to make sure that our young women, as well as our young men, are encouraged to pursue an apprenticeship in any field and that we make sure that we're not locking out disabled or BMA young people from one of the best opportunities they'll have in pursuing a career and support. And so I support the, the motion in the government's name and the amendment in the name of Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Liam McArthur. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's amazing how quickly Apprenticeship Year Week comes round each year. I am looking forward once again to hosting an event next week in the Parliament held by the Scottish Training Federation and Skills Development Scotland, and I hope to see many members at that event. It's not just an opportunity to talk about apprenticeships, it's an opportunity to meet some of the apprentices, to recognise their extraordinary skills, uh, and there's also an opportunity to hand out an award, so I hope that members will be there to see that. Clearly, the Scottish Government is doing the right kind of things. I was very interested in Ian Gray's comments about what happened in the past and the comparisons of the numbers. I don't want to get on that debate. But one of the things which I think is important at the moment is that Skills Development Scotland is actually making sure it knows what skills are required and doing its best, therefore, to match the apprenticeships with the skills which are required because that is a pretty obvious piece of, of uh, management across the, the nation and I'm grateful for it. 
Um, I have a number of businesses in my constituency, of course, that take apprentices, and I'd like to highlight two to <coughs> the chamber and indeed to ministers. Um, start with Whitaker's, which is, a, which is a quite a large, very specialised, very skilled engineering business just outside Stonehaven, which provides uh, extremely clever bits of kit and well-engineered bits of kit to the oil industry. Um, they have, I think, some 23 modern apprentices. That gives you some idea of the scale of the operation. Um, and they are very clued up as to what to do with them, to say an extremely good and innovative employer. <clears throat> I mean, my privilege to, to meet them just a few weeks back. Even more recently, though, I went to a relatively smaller business called Blaze in, in Lawrence Kirk. Again, very sophisticated, very skilled, providing uh, fire and safety solutions, uh, again, largely to the oil industry. But the point that they made when I asked them about apprenticeships is that for a very small business, it's actually quite difficult to find the information. Um, that's just not what they do. They make clever bits of kit, and they don't have a large HR department. And so I think, given the current aspiration of the government to get into small and uh, medium-sized businesses, um, it might be wise just to have a look at how that information is provided to businesses who are better at making widgets than they are actually looking to see how to handle these things, and that might be something the government would want to consider. Um, I heartily endorse Gordon MacDonald's comments about pay rates, uh, to which I really have nothing to add, but I would um, like to bring to the Chamber's attention the comments that were made actually by SICA, the Civil Engineering um, Association, with which I have quite a lot to do as convener of the Cross-Party Group on Construction. Um, and they were enthusiastic about foundation apprentices, uh, they're being piloted in two regions. Uh, and they clearly felt that those were good because they enabled even younger uh, folk to get involved. And it seems to me this is a real opportunity to ensure that youngsters at school can get some real workplace experience, some understanding of what it is the industry might be about, of the opportunities by going somewhere once a week, um, not just when they leave school, uh, but actually through the last two or three years at school in such a way that they can understand where this might lead, gain some of those personal skills which are so important uh, to getting on to an apprenticeship. Uh, I, I notice uh, the, the comment made actually by one of the supermarkets that uh, they uh, recruit on, I think, on personality, on attitude, and then skills come afterwards. And I think the ability to understand the workplace is actually important. You might have the right attitude, but you just don't know. So understanding what the world of work is about is actually extremely important to our youngsters. And I notice as an aside and as a, as a dad that my two teenagers uh, who went to, uh, sorry, when they were teenagers, went to work placement at school, uh, did not learn very much at all, and it wasn't a terribly useful experience, and I hope that foundation apprenticeships will turn out to be very much more useful. Finally, presiding officer, I wonder whether I can talk and get back on what I suspect is a bit of a parliamentary hobby horse of mine, which is research. Um, Audit Scotland, I think, in a, in a relatively recent report, made the point that it was quite difficult to evaluate quite how effective apprenticeships and indeed many of our training opportunities are. I wonder, presiding officer, whether we need just to encourage the government to do long, more longitudinal studies about what happens within our society. Because it's only by following a group of people necessarily relatively small, and it does cost some money, but actually following people through their teens and through their 20s and maybe even into their 30s that will discover how effective these well-meaning and well-organized programs actually are. And it's only by learning from that that we will do better in the future. Meanwhile, I encourage the government to carry on doing what it's doing. I think foundation apprenticeships are a serious opportunity and to be commended. Um, we need to promote gender balance. That's already been discussed. Clearly, we need to improve as best we can the liaison between schools and industry. Um, and we need to recognize that all these apprenticeships build skills, build confidence, and build our economy for the future. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Dennis Roberts. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and in the run-up to uh, Scottish Apprenticeship Week, like others, I welcome the fact that we are having this debate this afternoon. In that context, I very much look forward, uh, like uh, colleagues, to paying a visit next week to a local company in my constituency, in, in my case, Orkney Builders, to see firsthand 
the work they do in providing apprenticeship opportunities for young people in the islands I represent. Indeed, Orkney Builders is just one of a number of local building firms who, working alongside Orkney College, SDS and other partners, has shown a genuine commitment to apprenticeships and skills development over recent years. All of these businesses recognise that this investment is in their interests, it's in the interests of uh, their sector, uh, as well as the interests, of course, of the young individuals taking advantage of the high-quality work-based training on offer. So there are undoubtedly good and positive stories to tell, stories that illustrate the life-changing difference that apprenticeships can and do make, stories that demonstrate the energising effect that apprenticeships can have on the businesses that take them on. And Sophie Turner, the young stonemason apprentice taken on by Orkney Islands Council, referred to by Mike McKenzie earlier, is a perfect illustration of that. So the commitment to step up the number of apprenticeships from 25,000 to 30,000 is one that Scottish Liberal Democrats genuinely support. However, as I've said before, and as Ian Gray uh, pointed out earlier, it's not purely a numbers game. Overall numbers are important, but the quality of what is provided, where those opportunities are being created, and as importantly, where and to whom they remain elusive, are equally important. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister would, uh, would uh, have no difficulty accepting that. And so, Deputy Presiding Officer, while setting my remarks in the context of a general welcome, both of what has been achieved in terms of modern apprenticeships and the commitment to go further, I feel it's more valuable to spend my brief time this afternoon focusing on those aspects that are still not working as they should. A clear example of where opportunities simply are not being created is for those young people with a disability. This was the focus of my amendment for this afternoon, and while it was not selected, uh, I'm pleased that it's an issue picked up by Sir Vaughan McMahon and indeed Mary Scanlon in their amendments, which I'm happy to support, and it featured prominently in Rosanna Cunningham's uh, opening remarks. Both the Scottish Children's Services Coalition and Inclusion Scotland have spelt out in stark terms the extent to which young disabled people are being let down when it comes to creating education and training opportunities, and I think we all accept that this is simply not good enough. In a recent parliamentary answer to me on the very subject, uh, Ms Cunningham explained that, quote, as all apprentices in Scotland must be employed and recruitment is rightly a matter for employers, we do not have figures that tell us how many disabled people have applied for a modern apprenticeship opportunity. Meanwhile, Scottish, uh, Skills Development Scotland's own figures show that the overall number of modern apprentices who are disabled is less than 0.4%. Over the last five years, despite a dramatic increase in the number of apprenticeship places, there has been no improvement. By no reckoning can this be considered acceptable, particularly when one considers that around 8% of 16- to 24-year-olds is disabled. At the same time, in England, around 8.7% of modern apprenticeships are taken up by those with a disability. And even allowing for differences in the schemes north and south of the border, this discrepancy in performance is hard to fathom, much less justify. And I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to drill down further, further uh, to get a better understanding of why this discrepancy exists, uh, particularly uh, given the uh, SCSC's conclusion that, quote, Scotland fares worst of any of the home nations, indicating that major and concerted action is required. Meantime, the consequences should come as a surprise to no one as the SESC go on to say young disabled people have a similar level of career aspiration at the age of 16 to their wider peer group. By the time they are 26, they are nearly four times more likely to be unemployed. The government, of course, will argue that the concerted action is taking place. £3 million has been allocated following the Wood Report, which identified progress in this area as essential. And I join with others in welcoming the announcement, uh, presumably, uh, of the further uh, 500,000 uh, announced by the Cabinet Secretary in her opening remark. It's not clear, however, that what proportion of the overall funding will be allocated to the sort of interventions likely to increase the numbers of disabled young people successfully applying to take up modern apprentices. But perhaps the Minister can address this in our summing up. I, I suspect Ministers may also be reluctant to set targets for what, as Ms Cunningham said in her recent parliamentary answer uh, to me, is a matter for employers. However, Sir Ian Wood was very clear. He called for, quote, a realistic but stretching improvement target to increase the number of young disabled people to be introduced and reported on uh, annually. Indeed, ministers appear to have accepted the principle of targets by agreeing to increase the number of modern apprenticeship starts uh, from uh, minority ethnic 
communities. It would be interesting to hear from uh, Annabel Ewing in closing whether the government is willing to take a similar approach with regard to those with a disability uh, and the care leavers, and if not, why not? Serene also recognised that there was nothing to be gained by willing the ends but not the means and therefore recommended that funding levels to colleges and ME training providers should be reviewed and adjusted to reflect the cost of providing additional support to young disabled people and age restrictions should be replaced for those whose transition may take longer. These are sensible and practical steps. Deputy Presiding Officer, I was also intrigued to read Inclusion Scotland's comments about the access by those with a disability to the government's employability fund. As the aim of this fund is to support activity that will help people develop the skills they need to secure a job or progress into more advanced training, one would be forgiven for thinking that the proportion of starts by people with a disability be relatively high. In fact, that figure is only 2.5%. Again, it would be helpful to hear from the Minister uh, what major and concerted action has been taken to deliver the scale of change that we obviously need. There are other issues I should have uh, uh, raised, but on this occasion I think it's right to focus my brief remarks on increasing the opportunities to, for Ask those with a disability. Please. The government has a decent story to tell on modern apprenticeships, uh, but as the Equality and Human Rights Commission observes, we are missing a trick by failing to maximise the potential of all Scotland's people. Nowhere is that more evident than in relation to those with a disability, and that's why Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the government's motion, but also both amendments later this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, um, we, we're here to celebrate the, the opportunities for people going into apprenticeships. Uh, and I've listened very carefully um, to other members in, in the areas where perhaps opportunities are not as equal. And there is a perception out there that maybe perhaps people with disabilities cannot achieve uh, the same as those uh, without disability. But, Presiding Officer, we've got to look at the opportunities that are there. And certainly in my own constituency, if we look at the wide range of opportunities for people in the apprenticeship programmes, you know, they're wide and varied. And to be perfectly honest, the majority would um, be uh, open and available for people with a disability. I mean, I'm looking at areas within the hospitality sector, for instance. There's not many areas within the hospitality, sect sect hospitality sector that people with disabilities perhaps couldn't achieve. There's areas in the outdoors, presiding officer. Now, I accept that depending upon your disability, there, there, may, be, there may be health and safety issues uh, to prevent you maybe doing some work within forestry. Uh, but, you know, there are opportunities in the outdoors. And certainly uh, I know of the social enterprise uh, in my own constituency at Fox Lane provide opportunities for people um, in, in market gardening, for instance. So what I would be saying is let's have a conversation. The conversation with people with regard to their... Uh, what they would actually like to do in terms of job opportunities. Now, I know that RNIB, for instance, have, been, have an employment officer and have had people working in different parts of Scotland for many years. Uh, and in fact, I, 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 I used to work alongside them uh, prior to coming uh, uh, to Holyrood. But despite that, we still don't seem to get the numbers into employment. Now, why is it? Is it the perception? Because I actually do believe that the opportunity is there. I believe that there are jobs for people from all sectors and all walks of life. For instance, the Scottish Parliament here, uh, in their apprenticeship programme, it looked very carefully at their selection uh, to ensure that people from different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, uh, were given the opportunity uh, for uh, or the apprenticeship programme. People from ethnic or disability backgrounds. Yeah, those opportunities exist. But it is up to the employer to make those available and to uh, go through a selection process. Much has been said about degrees and vocational training. Presenting officer, I, I don't have a degree, but I don't have vocational training either. But, you know, maybe uh, like uh, Mr Gray, my ability to change a plug always depended upon my daughter's availability when she was three to tell me the colours of the, the plug, actually. Um, and thankfully, she knew her colours. But, but, presiding officer, it's not because the opportunity wasn't available for me to do certain things. It's just that I chose a different pathway. Now, I did 
uh, at one point work in an engineering factory. But again, you know, health and safety did come in and say, I'm sorry, you know, actually we think <laughs> uh, the, the, it is too dangerous for you to be here. Subsequently, I believe that there are measures now in certain factories that people with, uh, who are blind or, or different disabilities can work within those uh, uh, sectors, and that's absolutely fine. But I don't think we've actually moved a great deal in the last 40-odd years anyway of trying to ensure that we create the uh, places for people with disabilities. But part of the problem is that, and, and the Cabinet Secretary mentioned access to work. Now, access to work is available when you're in work. It's not access to work. It's available when you are in employment. That's when it becomes available. That's when they, they, they have the ability to support you in employment. What we need to do is to try and ensure that the availability whilst you're looking for work or going through training or on an apprenticeship programme is also there. So if you need a, a particular piece of kit to ensure that you can do the job just as well as someone else, then that kit should be made available. Because you may well be able to do the job, but if you don't have the right facility to enable you to do that job, then the opportunity then is denied. So it comes down to fundamental basics, presiding officer. And this is where we're always letting ourselves down, because we don't look at the basics. We don't look at that start, that opportunity. What are the barriers? Now, Siobhan McMahon was quite right. When I was in the equal opposite at the same time as Siobhan McMahon, we had a look at women in work. And recently, uh, I, was, um, a, uh, I was at the Afford campus, a, a new school within my constituency, and it's still undergoing construction. And I was talking to one of the construction directors, and he was saying he was pulling his hair out because he's still requiring people to come into the construction industry. He's offering apprenticeships. And he said he pulls his hair out, he goes to schools, he speaks to the young people. But he says none of the girls want to come and work for him. It's not because he's not a nice guy or anything like that. It's because they just don't want to go into that construction industry. Could you draw to a close, please? So what I'm saying, presiding officer, is the jobs are there sometimes. The opportunities are there sometimes. But we need to ensure that the, the, the right technology is there or indeed the perceptions are knocked in the head so people can go into a, the different types of jobs and get away from the stereotyping that we seem to still have. Thank you. Many thanks. Well done. Now call on Liz Smith. No, I beg your pardon, I don't. I call on Hans Malik, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. It is a pleasure to talk about Scottish Apprenticeship Week 2015, and I am glad to see that the target set for 20,000 modern apprenticeship starts each year is on target and may be exceeded this year. The young people involved see the program as a positive experience with 98% saying that they found the program useful. The role of Scottish Apprenticeship Week is to celebrate the success of the scheme, but we should also be able to reflect on the things that can be done better instead of only increasing the numbers of modern apprenticeships, we need to start look at quality and equality. And talking about equality, I've been in discussions with Skills Development Scotland and they have informed me that the progress in modern apprenticeship starts from minority communities has risen from 1.1% to 1.4%, as I think minorities make up 6% of the population aged between 18 and 24, this is still a major underrepresentation. Analysts from the Coalition of Race Equality and Rights, CRER, from apprenticeships and training on 31st of March 2014, found that young persons from the ethnic minority background were eight, yes, eight times less likely to be in a modern apprenticeship experience uh, complex whilst this, uh, a Scottish white person uh, compared to a Scottish white person. I welcome the creation of the key performance indications to increase the number of modern apprenticeship starts from the minority communities to equal the population share by 2021. However, this is a long-term target and I want to see evidence 
of the political will to achieve this target. I, I want to know what the Scottish Government has done in the next six months rather than in the next six years. I understand that Skills Development Scotland are, being, be bringing, are bringing to work with uh, BEMIS, Black and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure in Scotland, to increase participation in uh, ethnic minorities. In my discussions with SDS, I raised my concerns that BEMIS did not certainly have the capacity or the ability to deliver such a challenging target, especially on a Scottish-wide basis. And this is do no disrespect to BEMIS as an organization. I'm not going to let this be a box-ticking exercise. I will not allow the Scottish Government to get away with giving some money to one organization, one ethnic minority organization, so that they feel that they've actually done something in this area. I don't want to see a few events around Scot Scotland inviting the usual suspects from mosques and community organizations to eat and be talked to with no real engagement, no real change, and no real outcomes. This symbolic samosa events are no longer acceptable. I want to see the government to be proactive. There is no point in just talking, no, there is no point in just asking people to apply. What I need to see is support for ethnic minority people to get the skills they want to apply for from apprenticeships and, if, I, if you allow me to finish the sentence, uh, to apply for ap apprenticeships, jobs, etc. in the first instance, and I will give way. Thank you. And uh, I've listened carefully to Mr. Malik's uh, comments, uh, and I understand that uh, while he's welcoming some things, he has some concerns and criticisms. I would like to hear from him one thing that he thinks in concrete terms we could be doing that we're not doing. One thing. I could give you so many. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the presiding officer gives me the time, I can be here all day giving you examples. But, I, but just, just to satisfy your, your appetite, minutes. I'll give you one thing that you can do. You can actually create an organization which has a structure built which actually speaks to the young minority community people to train them to be able to apply for jobs, to train them so they can go for interviews, to train them so they have the facilities to go for additional training for promotions. There are so many ethnic minority people unemployed just now, it's no real. And the, the fact that 1.4% out of a 6% young population not getting places in apprenticeships is shameful. And I can give you other targets. The police are running with 1% employed at 6%. The fire service is less than 1%. Shall I go on? Is that enough? So let me, let me try, and, try and help the government, if I may. I want to see the Scottish government be proactive. I want the government to give me initial targets. I want the government to give me quarterly reports back to show me what ethnic minority people are actually doing and achieving from these organizations. I also want to see Scotland do better for its minority community. For example, there is no infrastructure in places like Aberdeen or Fife. Why not? Why are we not creating that? When is the government actually going to do that? How long are we going to have these Pakora Samosa meetings and no results? I want to see results. Please, for God's sake, do something for the minority okay, community. Let's just close, talk about please. it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Liz Smith. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I uh, reiterate our support for the Scottish Government's motion and the priority which I think uh, is placed on this very important issue? And can I add uh, my support to Mealy Scanlon's amendment, which I think raises some very important uh, additional issues, and also the Labour amendment? I actually think there are some very interesting uh, discussions taking place uh, in apprenticeship policy just now, both in the uh, context of the changing economic and educational environment that the Cabinet Secretary referred to in her opening remarks, but also in the context of the analysis uh, of the available data and how to measure the success uh, to date of the modern apprenticeship programme, because I think that's a, a very important aspect. Uh, that was very much the topic at the recent uh, cross-party group on colleges and universities, uh, which I think it was very clear from uh, many of those in the very front line of the provision of apprenticeships that there has to be a change of approach to ensure that there is a very 
qualitative dimension to apprenticeship programme rather than just concentrating on the uh, increase of numbers. And that was a point I think that Ian uh, Gray uh, raised as well. Uh, Mary Scanlon quite rightly pointed to the achievement side of that. I think that is a qualitative dimension. Uh, Nigel Don, I thought, uh, made a, a very important point about the provision uh, of the skills that are important to the actual demand within the economy. Uh, so I think that's uh, coming to the, uh, as I say, the qualitative dimension rather than the numbers game. Uh, Tony Coultis and Diane Greenleys of uh, Skills Development Scotland, they both argued that there has to be a much better, deeper engagement between employers and learners, uh, necessarily to ensure that they are much better prepared for the world of work. And they strongly argue that that has to take place at an earlier age. And I noticed that that was something that Jim McCall uh, said uh, earlier this week. Uh, I think the general feeling was that the Curriculum for Excellence uh, and the establishment of a, a new regional college structure uh, were good things, but again, it was pointed out that when it comes to the larger colleges, one of the most important things that they can do is to ensure that they can deliver when it comes to the demands of that very specific local economy. If you listen to what college principals are saying just now, that's a point that they uh, stress, and I think there are a few question marks just uh, around that. So I think assessments about the value of different levels of apprenticeship are very important, as is the assessment of the different skills-based uh, learning which they entail and how to articulate with different schools, colleges and universities. Um, but I think, generally speaking, it's a good picture. Uh, I think there was great praise for the ambition uh, to develop the 28, uh, 28 pathfinders uh, across the five sectors by August 2015. Uh, and the fact that that will benefit obviously 28 uh, cohorts of pupils, uh, which matches the ambition to involve all uh, local authorities, as I understand it from the Scottish Government. I think the target there is August 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, um, but you know, there are clearly examples, whether it's, uh, well, at the cross-party group, it was uh, West Lothian, Fife and the Forth Valley area. And they gave us very strong indication of the success of um, local authorities working together with educational establishments and with uh, business and industry. And I think they feel, felt very strongly about the innovative aspect of that qualitative... Just well, over all of this, because there isn't time in one single debate about apprenticeships, but uh, would the member accept also that the, uh, the growth in the number of regional invest in young people groups, which will be specifically employer-led, will help deal with some of the more localised regional employment issues? Uh, that she is uh, referring to. Liz Smith? Yes, I do accept that, Cabinet Secretary. But I, I think the point that's been made by two or three college principals is that they feel that, um, that the larger colleges obviously have to cover a much wider area and they're very anxious to retain the individual aspects of their very specific local economies, particularly, dare I say, in the areas that are removed from uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow. I think that point has been uh, very well made. And naturally, they point to the fact that they're concerned about the level of college cuts to some of the uh, courses that are, are particularly uh, involved in the provision of some people who would be further removed from the workforce. And, and I think that's something that, uh, as I say, it came through very strongly at the cross-party uh, group. The point uh, about uh, disability, I think, has been very well uh, mentioned by several members, by Siobhan McMahon, by Liam MacArthur. Uh, and I think, um, Cabinet Secretary, I think you were questioned on this uh, by Gavin Brown in, in, in a debate uh, at, just at the end of April. But I think... Not only do we have to address the gap between what's happening in Scotland and what's happening uh, elsewhere, uh, but exactly how that situation uh, has arisen. Uh, I think the uh, very other uh, important issue that we can learn uh, is about the lessons from abroad, because uh, Ian Gray was quite correct when he said that, that there are different approaches in countries like uh, Germany and Denmark and Switzerland, because they've been flagged up. Uh, by some employers as being very successful in the ability to deliver long-term sustainability when it comes to uh, apprenticeship involvement, um, but also it's because of the cultural uh, change. So I think, as I say, over, overall, I think this is very important. If I can just uh, finish on the point that George Adam made about uh, the, um, the real need to ensure that there is not a divide between vocational uh, and academic training, they, they go together. And increasingly, in the changing in nature of the economy and, and, and education, they have to be seen to complement each other. They're not separate. Uh, and the more we can do that, the more we'll be able to get over uh, what I think is a very unfortunate divide in Scotland at times, where people do view them uh, as different. So uh, uh, as far as uh, we're concerned, very happy to support the Scottish uh, Government's motion and also the Labour amendment. Excellent. Many, many thanks. And I call on Graham Pearson. Seven minutes, Mr Pearson. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am pleased to report that I am in the very comfortable position of uh, supporting the Government's motion, uh, supporting uh, Mary Scanlon's amendment, and of course my colleague Siobhan McMahon's uh, amendment also. Uh, many members have uh, responded this afternoon with their own family experience of a relative having gained access to an apprenticeship. I would add uh, to that uh, knowledge in sharing uh, my own experience that unfortunately my father was never offered an apprenticeship. As a result, it was my own experience to, to view that his entire working life was hard, brutish and poorly paid. And in that context, I applaud all the efforts of those who are involved in modern apprenticeships and apprenticeships of all, all types. Uh, I would therefore identify very strongly with the points made by Siobhan McMahon uh, and Hansela Malik about the issues surrounding equality, fairness and access. Indeed, as Ian Gray outlined in his uh, contribution in Scottish Apprenticeship Week, it's important that we realise the true worth of apprentices to our society and our future developments. And I also acknowledge that uh, Nigel Dawn uh, further outlined the, the values that arise from the benefits we gain from apprentices and the contribution they make in, in later life. And other members have outlined more fully that, that experience. Uh, but what can we look in the future to develop a better environment for our apprentices? The Cabinet Secretary mentioned that she encouraged employers. And I know that having gone around the south of Scotland and elsewhere in, in the country, employers, both medium-sized and larger employers, uh, have indicated that they need a confidence to know that when they take someone on as an apprentice, they will still be in business long enough to see that apprenticeship commitment fulfilled. So in that regard, the Cabinet Secretary could spend some time looking at the way in which local procurement processes operate to the disadvantage of local companies. Because if they can see that they can compete more readily in obtaining contracts, we will see more apprentices being taken on. Equally, these same employers have shared their view that the notion that apprentices can be shared between companies in order to offer some form of support to uh, young people, men and women, who seek to deliver on apprentices, many employers resist that notion and feel that by sharing apprentices, they won't deliver in terms of the quality of the experience and the breadth of knowledge that's required to develop apprentices for the future. They also raise the question about the preparation that they see evidenced in young people coming forward to be considered for apprentices, particularly within the building engineering context. Uh, and in that regard, the latest statistics in terms of Scottish attainment revealing a dip in literacy and numeracy and performance uh, measurements is a challenge. And there needs to be more work done by government to ensure that our young people are prepared for employment. Government has delivered an understandable focus on funding young apprenticeship opportunities for candidates. And it's reported to me by employers that as a result of that focus, eh, funding goes primarily to people under the age of 21. Increasingly, it's being experienced within the employment eh, environment that people over the age of 21 have developed a, a background where in the vernacular the penny has dropped and they want to contribute to working life and would seek to a, access apprenticeships. But unfortunately the level of support and grant that might enable that is not present to the extent that it is for others. Much comment from small and large uh, employers about the inability of those who come forward who do have the skills but haven't been developed not only in terms of their technical ability but that element of uh, work which is about selling ideas and selling product. And there is a great deal said by employers that they need schools and education 
to pay attention to that notion of how one develops the character of future employees to play their full part in that regard. There is a real desire amongst them, uh, employers for the government to prepare our young people for work, not only in promoting the whole range of uh, apprenticeship uh, opportunities, but particularly in regard to what was mentioned earlier in the debate about traditional uh, apprenticeship opportunities, that in building and engineering, we need to do more. And uh, the minister would do well to encourage employers to play their full part in mentoring within schools and offering work experience in order to encourage their involvement uh, in developing employment opportunities for our young in the future. At the end of this debate, it's been acknowledged right throughout the Chamber the importance of apprenticeships for the future. It is not only to ensure that these young people don't have the work experience that my own father had, but as importantly, and probably more significant for many, Scotland needs our young people to participate fully in the employment environment. We need to develop our competitive edge in a fast-changing economy and a fast-changing world to have any complacency in regard to how well we are currently doing. And there's obviously much better that we could do to see a minister who has a, a hunger to acknowledge the shortcomings in our current service delivery and develop more strongly promotion for the future. That is what our parliament would seek from our Cabinet Secretary and the Minister in the year that lies ahead of us. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And I now call on Annabel Ewing to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Uh, Minister, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I think the first thing I should do is to move the amendment in, in the which Government's name, which the Cabinet Secretary <laughs> omitted to do. Uh, so I am happy to do that. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, it has been a very positive and a constructive debate this afternoon, Presiding Officer, and I do thank all members for their contributions. Um, there are many uh, uh, suggestions uh, in terms of broad brush suggestions or indeed technical suggestions that have been made and obviously we always look closely at the debate afterwards, including with the officials, so we'll be happy to pick up anything that uh, uh, seems to be a sensible way forward. I would perhaps also take this opportunity uh, to say that we are happy uh, today to support the Labour amendment, uh, and um, we will not be in a position to support the Conservative amendment, not really uh, in terms of a difference in terms of substantive issues, but from a more technical perspective in terms of the way that the actual uh, 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 motion would then read uh, in the final analysis. Um, presiding officer, it's clear that uh, modern apprenticeships are indeed vital to our ambitions to offer young people the opportunity to gain the skills they need to take up rewarding and fulfilling jobs. At the same time, modern apprenticeships are also vital in delivering the skilled workforce that our employers need to secure uh, long-term economic growth. Over the past three years, we have supported over 77,000 modern apprenticeship starts, and I am proud of this government's record of growing the programme since 2007. Our commitment to expanding the MA programme aligns with a wider reform of vocational education across the entire learning and skills landscape, certainly. I, I just, she's made this claim again about expanding the programme. I did point out the numbers to her that if you compare like with like, the programme has not really expanded. Now, I don't mean that as a criticism, but I think it is the reality from which we need to seek to move forward. Will she acknowledge that that's the case? Annabel Ewing. Dean Gray is that uh, he, he, and he made this point during his, his contribution, that um, uh, in terms of the previous skill seekers programme at level two, that was a non-employed programme. Uh, and the level two modern apprenticeships, the people involved, they're all employed, and that is the crucial difference. That is the key difference. And that is what we are talking about when we talk about the success of our modern uh, apprenticeship um, programme. Um, in terms of our refreshed youth employment strategy, presiding officer, uh, the Developing Scotland Young Workforce published in December last year, we did set out our ambition to improve the employment prospects for all of our young people uh, and linking the needs of young people and the needs of our employers, as many members have raised today, is indeed central to that seven-year change programme that will seek to remove the structural issues that led to the uh, high levels of youth unemployment that we have seen 
in the past. However, we cannot deliver this on our own. Rather, we will continue to work with employers, with training providers, with local authorities, with colleges and third sector organisations to deliver our ambitions for a 40% reduction in youth uh, um, uh, unemployment by 2021. Uh, um, there has been a lot of discussion today, and quite rightly so, about equalities and how the MA programme is not currently working for certain groups of people. The Young Workforce Commission highlighted that underrepresentation impacts on the MA programme as it does across vocational education and indeed the wider labour market. These are complex issues and simply changing provision will not fully address the underlying issues with our uh, labour market. But I am sure that the funding announced today by the Cabinet Secretary to support the final development and implementation of a modern apprenticeship equalities action plan will uh, indeed be welcomed, for we do need to build a consensus on what all partners need to do to address the issues of underrepresentation across vocational education. Dennis Robertson. Certainly. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention on this point. Um, I certainly welcome the funding, and I'm just wondering if the Minister would agree with me that perhaps in trying to address that equality uh, uh, circle to some extent, that we look more closely to the education and careers advice um, uh, the, the opportunities that young people can have when they're leaving education into the work, uh, the field of work. Anna, will you? Mr. Robertson, for his intervention, I think that's a very uh, constructive uh, intervention, and indeed, uh, it is certainly our intention, and it is part of the uh, approach of the Developing Scotland Young Workforce Programme, that we do have much. Uh, better information given to young people whilst they are at school about what the world of work entails for all young people, including, of course, those who may require particular support. And we would wish to see that, of course, happening at a much earlier age, including, in particular, uh, in primary school, as Serene Wood uh, strongly uh, recommended. Um, but I do believe, in, in broad brush, that from a structural perspective, which is what the background to our endeavours is, we are already starting to see uh, a, a bit of success as regards the breaking down of the old distinctions between vocational and academic learning, uh, a point that was uh, uh, forcefully made by many members this afternoon, including Ian Gray, in terms of the uh, importance placed on education uh, when he was growing up and that his father placed on education. That is a trait common to so many, many households across the length and breadth of Scotland. And the, uh, it is incumbent on all of us to do what we can to continue to break down this uh, long-standing uh, uh, distinction, bogus distinction, that somehow the vocational and the academic are in competition with each other. Rather, they are complementary uh, to each other. And so we are committed to doing all that we can to make clear that the offer of a modern apprenticeship uh, to a young person to getting a job and getting paid uh, whilst gaining an industry recognised qualification is both a win-win for the young person concerned, for the apprentice, and it is indeed uh, a win for the uh, employer. Uh, and this morning I had the pleasure to visit uh, CCG uh, in Cambus Lang, a construction manufacturing company, and what struck me when I was speaking to many uh, young apprentices was their enthusiasm to do a good job and their appreciation that they had been given an opportunity to gain the skills they needed to start to make their way in the world of work, whilst, of course, importantly for them, earning a wage at the same time. And I would like to say, in response to many of the important points that have been made this afternoon about gender uh, segregation, that amongst the excellent young people I met this Minister, morning... Minister, just one moment, please. There's far too much noise in the chamber. Those who have just come into the chamber, could you please give the Minister the courtesy of listening to her? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amongst the excellent young people uh, that I met this morning, I did promise to say this, so I'm going to say it. Uh, there were Hannah Muir, a third year apprentice plumber, and Nadia Swift, a second year apprentice plasterer, uh, both proving the point very well, Presiding Officer, that there are no such things anymore as boys' jobs or girls' job, and I wish both young women uh, the best of luck with their future uh, careers. Uh, I do recognise, however, Presiding Officer, that there is much work still to do in tackling stereotyping of whatever kind, and I'm hopeful, though, that we are moving uh, in the right direction. Picking up on a few points, other points made uh, in today's debate, uh, Presiding Officer, um, Siobhan McMahon um, uh, 
raise the issue of, of the kind of delivery partners that it would be appropriate to work with, but my view is that it would be important to work with uh, a range of partners, which is what we are currently doing, to work with all those who have a role to play uh, in ensuring that we do the best for our young people in terms of ensuring that they have the opportunities uh, that uh, should be available to them. Uh, Mary uh, Scanlon uh, mentioned uh, again the societal issues that we are facing in terms of gender uh, segregation. I think it is important to stress in that regard that the Developing Young Workforce Programme does focus on the promotion of a diverse workforce to young people, including, as I said at my uh, uh, opening of my remarks, in primary schools. I'm afraid I've just got a very limited time and I do wish to I'm afraid I do wish to, to get through a few other comments on this occasion. Uh, Gordon MacDonald highlighted the good work going on in his constituency in Edinburgh. Uh, George Adam, uh, echoed by many speakers, including Nigel Don, emphasised the importance of ensuring that we have small business involved in the modern apprenticeship uh, project. And we are working uh, with local authorities, with uh, small business, to try to uh, ensure that they have the information that they would need uh, to uh, decide whether they were in a position to take on a young apprentice. The regional investing young people groups also will have a role to play. Uh, much has been made, presenting officer, of the um, position with respect to underrepresented groups. Uh, as I have said, the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of the uh, intention to proceed with an equalities action plan, I hope, will help to address the many real concerns of members uh, this afternoon. And I undertake that we will keep the Chamber advised of the progress uh, with respect to the Equalities Action Plan. Uh, with respect to Hanzala Malik's point about our determination to improve the position uh, for uh, black and minority ethnic uh, communities, uh, I would say gently to Mr Malik that we do work with a range of partners. We work with Bemis, but we work with other groups. I myself recently met with Mr Davidson, who is a representative of the STUC Black Workers Committee. We do take this issue most seriously, and we are working to make the progress we need to see. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I'm very much looking forward to celebrating with other members the Apprenticeship Week. Uh, I hope that members will engage in the process and take the opportunity to see for themselves how modern apprenticeships are benefiting our young people. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate. A point of order, Mary Scanlon. Presiding officer, given that we are all about to vote in this uh, debate and amendments, can the minister now explain the technical reason why the government is unable to uh, accept my amendment? I think that would be helpful to all of us in the chamber. Uh, can I say it's entirely up to the government whether or not they wish to accept the amendment? Um, that does conclude that debate. We now move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 13119. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13119. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13119, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13118 on approval of an SSI and motion number 13117 on designation of a lead committee. Moved on block. Question. These motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 13112.3 in the name of Siobhan McMahon, which seeks to amend motion number 13112 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Apprenticeship Week be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The yeah. amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 13112.2 in the name of Mary Scanlon, which seeks to amend motion number 13112 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Apprenticeship Week, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 13112.2 in the name of Mary Scanlon is as follows. Yes, 52. No, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that Motion No. 13112 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is amended on Scottish Apprenticeship Week be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that Motion No. 13118 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that Motion No. 13117 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.